Hey everybody, Norm over here, and uh, a lot of folks have been asking, what's going on with the Ask Norm segments that you guys were coming up with? And we've been going through a remodel over here, so the place has been torn apart. It's made it real difficult for us to do some of our stuff, but I promise we're going to get on with it. We're going to um, have more of a regular thing going with the Ask Norm, because a lot of people have been inquiring. And uh, we've got a special guest with us today. I've got my buddy James Stevenson, who we have dealt with James for I don't know how many years. I mean, if I told you, it probably wouldn't sound right because James still be looks pretty young. It's got to be 30 years. Yeah, a long time. <laughs> about when you were on Tam from Van Owen. Yeah, you know, the old that's school. right. A long time. It was around and 86. Yeah. yeah. Just to fill you in on James a little bit, James was with the cult, Generation X, Chelsea, The Alarm, on and on. What else? Keep going. Uh, I've been playing doing this thing called Holy Holy with Woody Woodmansey and Tony Visconti. The, the International Swingers. The International Swingers with Clem Burke. But the Holy Holy thing, it's um, Tony Visconti, if you know who that is, he produced like 12 Bowie albums and Woody Woodmansey was the drummer in the Spiders from Mars and Mick Ronson is one of my all-time guitar heroes so I get to be in with the people that play that on the record. That worked out perfectly because yeah, you're I such I a big love, Rono love, fan. I'm a huge fan. He's the reason I picked up a guitar when I was a kid. So yeah. fantastic. it's been fantastic. So you, yeah. get to, you get to do a little tribute to Rono every it's, night. Exactly. Uh, amazing. Yeah. So we, we did like six weeks around the States last April and I hope we're coming back next year. Fantastic. And I've just been doing some shows with the Swingers with Clem Burke and Gary Twin who, you know, Gary obviously. Yeah. And hey, um, yeah, we've got a new bass player in that, John Carlucci. Yeah, so, he's great, that guy. Yeah, yeah that's and a great little band because they do songs from every era. They've got some cult songs, they've got some uh, Blondie songs. Yeah. They've got a couple of old Pistol songs. And in we've there. got our own album just and, come out with and Gun Shameless Control Plug. Song. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And you guys recorded you know, that. You guys recorded that year, right? We did. Too. We did. We recorded some of it um, in my buddy uh, Tommy Dietrich studio in Encino, and then we did some of it at Dave Grohl's place, Six Hundred Six, right? yeah. which is awesome. Just the most amazing place. You know, it's got that Sound City board right. that he made the yeah, film no about. And yeah. yeah, it's the most amazing place, and he has like. 50 Trini Lopez, 60s Trini Lopez is in like black and colors you don't see. Well, you can really have enough Trini Lopez guitars. You know what's really funny is that <laughs> years ago, yeah, you, could, you couldn't give those things away. All yeah. of a sudden, a few guys start playing them and look yeah. what you got. You know, I mean, uh, you know, and it's I, I always like a, thought I always thought they were cool guitars. Yeah, you know? they were. Yeah. They were, it's basically 335 and yeah. six on a side tuners. Yeah. You know, not the F holes, but the cat's eye and exactly. all that. It was a, it was always a cool guitar, yeah. but for whatever reason, you know, Trini, you know, kind of, you know, a lot of people felt that maybe it was old fashioned being right. the Trini Lopez. I like Trini very much, yeah. you know, yeah. and I think he's very cool. And if you hang around long enough, everything yeah. comes around. Well, so absolutely, all of a sudden. Another great guitar gets recognized when it's been ignored for a long yeah. time. It needs the yeah. full depth ones, the Trini Lopez Customs sure. to catch on next. Yeah. Well, know. that's the other, the Barney uh, yeah. Kessels, the next and guitar the that's taken Kessel. off right now. I've that's always the new thought Trini. Looked, I the Barney when Kessels. I was a kid, I saw a picture of Steve Howe and he was like playing a Kessel and it was like, what is that? Yeah, yeah. that's the right. new Trini Lopez right now. That's what right. everybody yeah, seems to be, be wanting. Next. I had a number, a uh, buddy of mine named Bob Wirtz who played with Trini for many, many, many years. And, you know, and it's funny because as I say, things get ignored after a little while. You know, it's like everything's hot in the beginning. They get ignored after a while, and then people go, you know what, that's pretty damn cool. And people start recognizing it yeah. again and all that. So, Nick, we're going to hit a couple of these questions. Yeah. Because James can help us answer some of this stuff, too. If I can. We got to, <laughs> we got, we've had some questions piling up, obviously. Thank you very much, everybody. I've got one I've got to lead off with, Norm, from Tippers. It says, uh, it's about your new book. Confessions of a Vintage Guitar Dealer, which is a great read. If you haven't got it, it says, Hey Norm, I've just received your new book and I need your help. Because I couldn't stop reading it. I didn't go to work. I've lost my job. My wife's <laughs> left me. Please could you send me a 59 Les Paul by way of compensation? Great book. Thank you. Well, I'm glad you like the book. <laughs> and the 59, as soon as somebody donates one to me, I'm happy to send it your way. Unfortunately, I haven't been getting a lot of donations lately. I've been giving donations more than getting them. So, uh, Tipper, thank you for your support and your love of the book. We'll try. S sorry you got fired. <laughs> you know, shit happens. Yeah. What can I say? You know, so. All right. All right. Um, we've a got a, more serious. We got another one from uh, Denver, from Whitehaven in England. So, as soon as we're semi English on this episode, uh, Denver it's 50, Watson. 50 right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 
Uh, Denver Watson says, Norm, you've probably been asked a million times, but what's the one that got away? Has there been a guitar that slipped through your fingers? Well, there's been a number of them that got away, and probably the most memorable, and it's in my book, was George Harrison's Gretsch uh, Country Gentleman, which he offered me, and I figured nobody would believe me that I had George's guitar. I had never dealt with a big star really before, and here I am dealing with George Harrison. I figured nobody's going to believe me if I tell them I have George Harrison's guitar. They go, yeah, and you got Napoleon's suit too, or something <laughs> stupid like that. So. Uh, that's one that got away. What do, what do you think, Mark? We sold a lot of cool stuff here. There's been a lot of them, yeah. I'm trying to think. We're most of the Blonde D'Angelico, yeah. the New Yorker that you got that was immaculately preserved. Yeah. That gold top from earlier this year, that 58. Uh-huh. Brad of, Whitford got that. Brad guy. got that one. Yeah. What, what about, about you, James? What about, well, I was going to ask you, because like, I saw you buy a show of probably about 10 years ago. You bought an early 60s white 355 with black binding. That was that? so cool. It was. No, you know what? I thought you would have kept that. You know what, you know what happens with me? I, I decide I'm going to keep stuff. Yeah. And then I started looking in the mirror and going, at your age, what am I doing keeping all this stuff? I'm just going to drop dead with it all. Well, yeah. And then Marlene and Mark and Nick and Jen and everybody else here. And Get your stuff. Jordan, they're going to have to sell it. Yeah. So I figured, you know, what the hell. And somebody started twisting my arm. And the next thing I know, the guitar was sold. Yeah. White with I often think of not so much about ones that got away, but ones that I had that I kind of sold, that I didn't want to, you know. Or, well, uh, what are some that you've had? Like, you've, when I was first in I Chelsea, know few, you, in like 1978, you know, my main guitar was a 56 Junior, because I, I don't know how, but even when I was a kid, you just the American guitars were just the best. They were, you know, the Fenders and Gibsons and Epiphones, they were just what everyone wanted. That's what you wanted, yeah. And I had this 56 Junior that I used for a couple of years, and I needed a new tape recorder, and I ended up swapping it doing a straight <laughs> trade for a Revox A77 tape recorder, which is worth, it was worth about the same at the time, about £350 in the late 70s. And I think I still have the Revox in the attic, it's old technology now, I think it's worth about 15 bucks. Yeah. yeah. And I, I still look out for that tuning because I can remember the number, which oh, was really? 67711. So if anyone out there's got it, uh, I'd like it back. There James is old junior, yeah. yeah. You know That's what's, a piece of history. You right? know what's kind of funny, you guys across the pond there, recognize the quality of the American guitars early on. Yeah. You recognize the quality of American blues when everybody had kind of forgot about it. And we re were reintroduced to, Ameri to American blues Fine through bricks. you guys yeah. over there. Yeah. You know, strangely enough, you know, everybody kind of ignores their own no. stuff that's right in their backyard. Yeah. And it takes somebody else to recognize right. the quality of it. Yeah. And then next thing you know, we're yeah, back yeah. again. Yeah, yeah, we were talking about that watching the uh, watching that Keith Richards documentary where he's hanging out with Buddy Guy and uh, Howlin' Wolf and, and all sure. those guys and visiting Chess Muddy. Records and Muddy Waters was painting the ceiling and he, he was like, "Wow, this is unbelievable!" These heroes to the English guys and then yeah. they kind of they did help I mean, them get their career back and yeah. you know it's funny because I, I had a band and we used to play in the '70s and we did a lot of blues. And we backed up like Eddie Cleanhead Vincent, Roy Milton, Albert Collins, uh, Big Joe Turner, uh, you know, Big Mama Thornton. In all those acts, they were barely getting paid. I mean, you know, for a few hundred dollars, you could have had them play in your venue. And I mean, it was really heartbreaking. I mean, we. Back is that still Chitlin? You can have the international swingers with you on the phased out by that. I think the Chitlin <laughs> circuit kind of was there, but these were acts that didn't necessarily have the money to put their own big band together. And what ended up happening is they had to, you know, play with whoever was backing them up. You know, they liked our band because we played kind of simple. And I had a great harmonica player and Rick Vito on Duke guitar. Logan. Duke Logan. Duke Logan, who was great. Dan Duran on bass. Yeah. Joe Ueli, who ended up with John Mayall for so yeah. many years. I remember seeing you uh, backing up Bo Diddley at the Coconut Teaser. Sure. And, yeah. uh, all those places down at Raji's, and there were a lot of guys you used to back up. Right, right. but you know, it was funny because, you know, the audience, um, you know, was, they were rediscovered by the Brits, mm. and um, that gave a lot of them their career back where they could actually make some money yeah. again playing music. And when we played, you know, it was primarily a white audience. I mean, you know, there really wasn't a lot of people uh, that were appreciating the blues that were, you know, the African Americans, you know, which is really strange because it's such an amazing thing that yeah. they came up with that is so much of, of American, American culture. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, that's uh, absolutely and right. it was totally ignored. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's almost like you have to have somebody else remind you how great it is, what's in front of you. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. And then later on with Punk Rock, I mean, The Clash took out, didn't they? They took out Muddy Waters on the road. And oh, that's like right. That, yeah, yeah, know. yeah. Sure. Bo Diddley yeah. as well. I and think, Bo Diddley. Yeah. Maybe, I, maybe I meant Bo Diddley. I might have got that back yeah. to Trump. But, but also very early on in like the late 50s and stuff, lots of the British bands use like Hofner guitars and like German made stuff. And it, yeah. It's in the early 60s that I think you can suddenly see, and especially, you know, with Cream and everything like that, suddenly everyone's using Gibson. Well, when we were kids, it was, there was a lot of Hofners and stuff around and, and stuff like the Beatles used to use because all that stuff came from Germany into Liverpool, right? Right. And that was how, and it was, they must have been getting it really cheap or something. Yeah, yeah. Because was it like Hank Marvin? The, yeah, the I was just going to say well, that. Well, 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 the other thing, the, this was, like the Hofners and the Harmonies and the, and the cheaper end guitars, there were a lot, an awful lot of those floating about. But yeah. if you really started getting good, then you wanted either Strat. pink strap like well, Hank yeah. Marvin's or anything with Gibson written on it. I had a yeah. melody maker and then I, I just, like you with your junior, I remember my first Les Paul, it was just like, oh God. But there, was a, there were a lot of tariffs between like trade tariffs between the US and the UK back then, which yeah, is why so not that many Gibsons and Fenders yeah, made their way until yeah, sure. made, really until the mid sixties, that's when you start seeing a lot of stuff. Yeah. And there were distributors, so a lot of the times the distributors chose what stores were gonna um, yeah, yeah. get yeah. some of the American goods. Yeah, and well, you get all the myths about, you know, the Selma cases, because apparently, you know, Fender shipped all their stuff in just in boxes and then yeah. Selma put their own, them in their own cases, which now count as you know, original as original guitar. Fender, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah that's cool. And uh, and of course there was back then people wanted English amplifiers like Marshalls and High Watts and you know that's stuff one that thing who was that using guys really an American guitar. Great. Well, Jim Marshall, I mean, his his first J1045 was a head version. He basement. tried to copy basement. a basement, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm a Marshall guy, and when you get a good one, there's lots of people making boutique amps out. I mean, there's you know Dave Friedman guys like that that are making amazing yeah. amps. Yeah. But I still use just regular unmodded Marshalls. Can't beat so the original. I like them. Yeah. yeah. You know, speaking of cases and all that, uh, there was, uh, and I mentioned this in my book, um, there was a place called Bullwin Industries, and they were in Orange County, and I had a buddy of mine who was into vintage guitars and bought some guitars for me. However, he found this place. He ended up going out there, and they had. They made a lot of the original Fender cases. cases. For the, oh, wow. You know, so they had the tweed cases, the brown cases, the black cases, the white cases, the plastic cases Imported, that they yeah. did, you know, for, um, they did like some of these molded cases back in the day too. And they had a lot of these. And so my friend went there and he bought some stuff from them. And I contacted them. And, uh, and one of the guys there said, yeah, we've got a bunch of cases there and some are perfect, some are in, a state of 90% no. build. Yeah. And by the way, we have some instruments that they sent us for fitting to, f yeah. to fit the cases, to build the cases. So, uh, <laughs> you know, so that's pretty cool. And, uh, you know, I said, well, I'm gonna come up in a few days. I said, you know, why don't you look around and see if you see any, uh, um, you know, any of these instruments. So about two days later, I get like uh, a call and the guy says, yeah, you know, we've got like this old Stratocaster. It's got a little water damage because it's been sitting there for I don't know how many years. I asked the guy, the serial number turned out to be a 54 Strat and a few things. I said, well, what do you want for the Strat? He said, I don't know, like 35 bucks or something like that. But, you know, I almost had a heart attack getting down there. You yeah. know? And when I saw this place, it was amazing. I bought so many cases from them. I got like Fender keyboard basses and I got, uh, oh, wow. you know, uh, the, you know, some odd Fender acoustics like the King, Kingman, Fender uh, Kingman, yeah. Kings, Newport, and so. Newports, and you know, just some other odd stuff. I think there was a Jag or Jazz, uh, jazz Master that was included there, but they had them all like piled in a box, all scratched up, and wow. it was like, wow. you know, it was like it meant nothing. How long ago was that? Well, when I did that, that was probably, it was before the store, so I'm gonna say maybe 72 or 73. Wow. So wow. Um, it was before I had a store, but, you know, and I had a little network of these guys that wanted to buy some of this old stuff, so I knew who to call. But, I mean, when the guy told me the serial number of the Strat, you know, I started shaking, and I was like, <laughs> all right, let me get the address, I'll be right down there, and, you know, it was, it was pretty amazing. I know that feeling. Yeah. Because I, I was looking for a Fender Electric 12, because I like those guitars, and 
the first one I bought was in a pawn shop on Santa Monica Boulevard right here. Uh-huh. And I've been looking for one. This guy had, had it just like behind the counter in the case. And I said, how much do you want for the 12 string? And he said, 150 bucks. And I'm like, I thought he was messing around <laughs> at first. Yeah. And then I'm like, going up, plus tax. And he says, yes, of course, plus tax. He was a Russian dude, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I've still got the guitar. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. Wow, if that was 72, so that was before you had premises, what, how were you, yeah. how, were you selling stuff out of the car? It or? was, well, I had a, a place in Sherman Oaks. I had a, a two-bedroom apartment, then a three-bedroom apartment, and there were just guitars all over Everywhere. the Everywhere. Yeah. And it was, I would run ads in the LA Times. I mean, you know, so wanted to buy in, wanted to sell. Mm. And uh, so I developed a network, and uh, Robbie Robertson came to me and threw my ad in the LA Times. Yeah. and. That really helped out, you know, as far as getting me introduced to uh, a clientele out here. Yeah, it was all a lot more fun before eBay and the internet. Oh, really. yeah. Well, it was but like it prospecting. Was, uh, you yeah. know, I mean, you it just was like never knew. In a way, you yeah. know? I mean, you never knew what you were in. You yeah. know, you put your plate in the uh, water and come up and whatever yeah. happened to be yeah. there. You know, when you, so. you used to drive down to uh, was it Union Station to get the oh. early copy of the paper, yeah. so that whatever you get it first and actually see it yeah. first and you could drive there and buy things. Well, what, what, instead of what I ended internet. up doing is I went down to the LA Times and I just camped out there and <laughs> I wanted to see when the first papers trucks were coming be. out. Yeah. So I would follow the trucks. Then I realized that the Sunday Times was coming out on Saturday. Of course, it was Saturday's news, but it was Sunday's classified. Yeah. And so I would call people up at like six o'clock Saturday morning about their Sunday Times <laughs> ads and half the time people would hang up on me or be pissed yeah. but I was able to talk a lot of folks into letting me come down early and buy their stuff. That's very That's cool. 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 Um so anyway, James, we know you're a Les Paul guy through your through your many story career, yeah, especially uh, uh, like, you know, the custom came into play a lot when you were with the cult and uh yeah. you seem to use a custom all the time now, don't you? I've always used customs, Stage. really, you know, since well, I had a standard, I had the junior when I was in Chelsea, but then when I joined Generation X in 1980, I had a, the white custom. Yeah, I've got and a that's few become of those, sort of them. your signature. Yeah, it's the Steve Jones guitar, really, but I mean, I've always used them Steve as well. Jones, James Stevenson. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, you were the lines early getting blurred. Yeah. I was lucky enough as well, about five years ago, to get offered a real burst of 60. And I've got to say, you know, I've played Les Pauls all my life, and it, I don't know what they did back then, but it blows everything, everything out of the water. Right. I mean, I wouldn't take it on the road, but I've used it in the studio, and it just yeah. sounds incredible. Yeah. You know? Well, you know, it's the wood, the alloys and the pickups, the way yeah. it was constructed. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to put a finger on it, but, yeah. uh, and I've always said, you know, I mean, they're, they're building some very nice guitars, and they have reissues of Les Pauls, R8s, R9s, yeah. R0s, you know. Yeah, yeah. They're very cool. But they can't even quite duplicate a case. They can't <laughs> no. make a brown case. The stitching rate right or the the, the, the latches, right, the stitching, yeah. all that stuff, so that you can't yeah. even tell the difference between an old okay. one and a new one. You know, you should be able to duplicate a case. You should. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. I never How thought of it. How are you make a guitar? Yeah. They and don't sound the same. I've had people come around yeah. to AB, you know, my friend Emil, who you know as well, yeah. he's got two made by a guy called Terry Morgan, who's a boutique, and he makes great guitars, yeah. they sound great. And But when you AB it with a real one, it's just yeah. not even There's close. There's not necessarily like, just the volume, it's the No, no, tone. no, it's not, yeah. it's the, it is the tone. It's not because the Because some R9s will put the more output with the pickups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, a, it's a mixture of everything though, isn't it? It's the, it's the tone, it's the wire. Yeah. We've talked about this before, and then, there must have been some magic, something. Yeah, something. Well, happened. you know, you've played quite a few. Yeah. Mark, what do you? What do you uh, it's a response player? thing. It's a. It's yeah. an everything thing. I don't know if it's something in your brain because you know you're holding it that, it that you want it to be better. Uh, it just is. Yeah. People say it's between the glue, the paint. Because some people say that the gold tops don't sound as good because they've they got gold paint. They feel good <laughs> when you put them on. It's yeah, the yeah, way. Well, the gold tops sound <laughs> pretty the damn good. It's the and the yeah. way they hang and everything. So, but then there are people that say that you can hear the difference between pinstripe and basket weave grill on a Marshall cab, which I think is a <laughs> slightly fanciful to say the least. Yeah, you know? a little bit. But the other thing that I've just got into, well, I've always been into them, but is that I've collected the 20th anniversary Les Paul Customs from 74. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? And I've just got the final one to complete the set. In the Groom book, it says they did them in black and white, but I've got them in eight different colours. What have so you got? I've seen Tell us what they are. If I can remember. Okay, I've got black and ivory, tobacco burst, cherry sunburst, um, natural top, wine red, 
I just bought a cherry one from oh, a British that's it. dealer. Sure, yeah. And the rarest one of all is, have you ever seen the Brazilian cap? Yeah, yeah, they made yeah. I've 52 yeah. of them in 74. I've, I've well, got well, I saw it because you showed me the picture, but I've yeah, never but I've got seen a 20th anniversary look. version of that. You well, know, so. I think I had a gold, a gold custom of the 20th anniversary at one time. This oh, was oh, oh, yeah. 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 So yeah. Yeah. That. There might be one more <laughs> that's missing. Sorry. Bummer. The walnut and the gold top. Yeah. Well, that's it. Yeah. If, it, any other if it's out there, get in touch with James. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, all right. Uh, as vintage guitars become rarer and rarer, do you see a time when reissues become collectible? Perhaps a new wave of vintage guitars? You know, I absolutely do. Um, and, I, and we're already seeing that because yeah. there's been, you know, a number of things that are really cool that are reissued. Unfortunately, a lot of these companies now, everything becomes That's a reissue. Everything's a limited mm -hmm. edition. And they're making a lot of stuff. Yeah. You know, they put, they're making two, I think, Gibson Fender probably are making too many guitars. If it was up yeah. to me, I would thin it down yeah. to the white ones and all that. Yeah. You know, but, um, you know, it's a matter of sifting through some of the things and finding the ones that are going to last over yeah. time and be desirable. Right. The, um, we, the we've artist, seen, sorry, but you, you know, the artist related burst reissues. Those, yeah. the those things are really those collectible. Those collectors already. choice, yeah. things, choice the one pages, pages, that's the, the, the uh, fields, the, yeah, yeah. all those, the Billy Gibbons. Exactly. The, and there's, there's some that are better than others. Oh, I'm sure. And the ones that are better, you know, time will sift that out. Yeah. And, determine which are the ones that are the most desirable. Yeah. But, you know, unfortunately, all the companies, everything's a limited edition this and a limited edition of that, and you gotta be able to kind of look through that and see, you know, what are the good limited editions. Uh, what was that list, but was it Mike Bloomfield, that one? That yeah, all those, sounded amazing. All, those col all the Jimmy Page ones always seem to sound really yeah. great, and people are asking, I don't know what people ask over there, I've been seeing them the, the, but some of the teens to twenties to forty well, wow. for this it's like that's a lot some of money of for a new guitar. But you, you know. can ask anything you want. That With doesn't mean you're yeah, gonna, gonna get, get it. it. Yeah. But, uh, so. But I some mean, of the other signature series ones we've seen, like uh, Warren Haynes 335, uh, uh, some of the Bonamassa Rusty stuff. Anderson 335s, yeah, the they Rusty's sound fantastic. Good. Some of the Bonamassa stuff is really cool. Bonamassa Joe has really got a great handle on what makes a good Gibson guitar, and he's no. really no. kind of you know having guys like that who really know directly. And even, oh, even those uh, ES330 reissues that we saw that came Some out. Those were, were, oh, they look really with good With the rubber well. stamp serial yeah. numbers, if you yeah. didn't know what you were looking for. Yeah. They were, yeah, they were great, yeah. One of those. So there's definitely progress in that, in that area. But give me the old stuff. Any day. Give me old stuff anytime, yeah. yeah. Hallelujah, that's what I say. <laughs> that's why I'm here. And, yeah. uh, you know, uh, that's the whole premise of this business, really. Yeah. And exactly. the store looks great, by the way. Thank you Fantastic. very much. Well, uh, I yeah. I have to bow to Mark on that because I let him kind of. So you're decorating his own way of side hobby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I've got a nice one here from Sammy Tuthill, uh, which I'm going to ask James as well. He says, "Can Norm, but Norm and James and Mark, can you give your opinion on the magical tone of pre-CBS strap pickups? What in your ears makes them sound better?" I'm, Whoever wants to, I'm a humbucker guy, so it's probably better to pass that question over to Norm. You know? <laughs> well, right. I'll tell you what I think, and I think it's alloys that were used in the wind of the pickups um, that definitely have, uh, they're not available anymore, some of the metals that were used. I mean, they all say, that, oh yeah, it's, we can do the same thing, mm -hmm. but it doesn't quite have the magic. And the wood of the guitar, you know, has a lot to do with it too. There's a chemistry between the pickups, the wood, the build, everything. Let me, ask, let me ask Mark. I think it's a lot of output. I, what is around 65 that they really started wiring the pickups a lot hotter. That's when you really start getting the, the strat on stuff yeah. in 65, 66. It's yeah. like something when about the, the late 50s, the slab board era stuff, they, 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 they're in the fives. They're yeah. not these high six I was output in, pickups. I was like in they Italy in about 10 years ago, and a guy I knew I was into guitars, and he took me to a friend of his his house, just like an ordinary, regular, sort of modest house. But he had a strap from every year, from like 54 wow. until like the late 70s. And he made me play every, every single, single one. one. <laughs> and the best sounding one, in my opinion, was a 61 slab board. Really? Yeah. Get into that. Yeah. Wow. It just sounded just like heaven, you know, it's amazing. Wow. I mean, all the 50s ones were great as well, but you know, every 
not all guitars made in any particular year. I mean, bursts vary a lot. They're not always Burst amazing. Very, yeah, you know, I, I yeah, 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 yeah. It might just be that he had a great yeah. slab board, but it definitely really stood out. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, and also, depending on what type of music that you're playing, I mean, even for certain things, I, I'm not a huge fan of the late 70s strats, but they can work for yeah, certain things. They work sounds, right for yeah, some things. Yeah. Yeah. But Mark yeah. probably, I, I mean, you've sold more early 60s strats than this last... 12 month yeah. period that I've, I've seen it. You know. It's just, I don't know, it's something about the lack of output, I think, that makes you turn the amp up a little more, that, that makes the amp work a negative. little harder, yeah. as opposed to the really yeah. loud. Everything now is so loud. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, people like loud, but I don't think, I think they get loud. We were just talking about it, loud is not tone. And all the loud variants is, on the yeah. strap pickups, like the noiseless ones and the T3 and the and The, the active noiseless pickups strap pickup is great if okay. you're if you're dealing in the digital realm and you're you're yeah. playing with it. But noise is part of the charm. Doesn't sound like doesn't a sound strap. like a strat without the noise. It's a pain in the ass. You got to do <laughs> yeah, a sixty true. cycle hum. Well, it's like the that beam. hum is part of the charm yeah, of the old guitar. That's what gives you your you Stevie that. Ray, your Rory yeah, Gallagher. You, you, you lose uh, that charm. You your lose, Chris Rea, who has yeah. a great sounding strat. It's the P ninety yeah. thing is the same deal as well, yeah. isn't it? You know, but I've actually got like a seventy four. I've had it for a long, long time, over thirty years. A seventy four bullet headstock strat, just a sunburst one, that yeah. I think sounds really, really great. Yeah. You know, I've got a 62 reef in, uh, that's the one I use if ever I need like a clean tone in the studio, I'll use a 62 reef in and a blackface super reaver, which I think, you know, sounds, they call it the king of clean, don't they? The king of clean, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, don't underestimate, a, you know, early 70s, into the late 70s, it gets a bit different. Right, but, but the early 70s guitar is really good. Because, I mean, a lot of that funk stuff that you hear, yeah. Those 70 strats work because they feel. Nile Rogers. Yeah, yeah, that's the sound of those right records. There. Yeah. That's the yeah. perfect example. Yeah. So, anyhow, listen, I want to uh, thank you all for watching this segment of uh, Ask Norm. And I'm sorry it's been a little while since our last segment, but we were doing a remodel in here. And <laughs> since I had James in here and we were able to trap him, uh, you know, we like to do that with our friends. It's a pleasure, and no. Love thank it. Thank you, buddy. I always appreciate it. You know, we're old friends. We've done a lot of business over the years. And, uh, you know, and James has played with a, a lot of important groups. And and go see the swingers if you're in LA. Yeah. Mark. James. Thanks a lot. Nick. Norm. Norm. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, I forgot at my age. Anyhow, that's Norm's segments. Thank you guys for watching. We'll catch you on the next one.